Thank you so much. Uh, well, yeah, thanks for the introduction, thanks for the invite. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to be here. And today I'm going to talk about creative altruism. Um, you must be wondering what the fuck is that, because <laughs> you've never heard of those two words together. Even our PR director at the agency told me, well, you're going to talk about what? Because um, it's not really a common thing. You don't really see those two things together, and especially coming from an advertising background. So yeah, I just want, uh, I went like, straight to the basics. As a lot of people ask me, what is altruism? I said, this is uh, sincerate and selfless concern for the well-being of others. So my talk is about um, what happens if as a communicator, as a, as a person that has been working in this industry for so long, uh, like me, we use all our knowledge and all our creativity uh, um, in causes that really need it. Um, we work for brands every day, and we solve very, very difficult business problems uh, and creative briefs, but what happens when you use all that knowledge for something else? And you do it not for can, not for personal profit, not for fame, not even for a brand, not even for a logo at the end. What happens when you put yourself second and volunteer for causes that could really benefit from having a, a creative vision. Uh, and you do it for something bigger than you. Uh, in an era where there's a lot of walk washing, uh, where brands try to take advantage and exploit every single social cause available, like Marks and Spencer, for instance, launching the LGBT uh, um, sandwich, and basically, LGBT stands for lettuce, guacamole, bacon, and tomato. Amazing. Uh, what happens when, when uh, instead of doing this, we start focusing on societal uh, profit? Sorry, one thing. I can't see my notes anymore. Okay. You're fixing that. OK, cool. Um, what happens if you start? Um, focusing on societal uh, profit uh, instead. I think there's, in a way, there's so much profit you, we can make <laughs> in this industry. What happens if you actually challenge that notion and start chasing a different type of, of profit? And I find it quite refreshing myself as a creative to start like creative direct causes in, in culture that ac actually nobody really asked me to do, but I just, you know, try to make things, uh, people see things from a different perspective through creativity. The first uh, case I volunteered my time for was the legalization, or well, the non-legalization of uh, abortion in Argentina. I don't know how familiar you are with the subject, uh, but abortion is still illegal in my home country. Uh, it's getting very, very handmade still as, as, as we speak getting very, very under, the, under his eye. Um, i show you some rough numbers of how serious the problem is. Uh, 500,000 uh, abortions per year, one woman dies every week, 135 gets hospitalized every day to abort abortion related complications, and those women can also feel jail if, you know, a doctor in a hospital is super Catholic and decides that that person just did something illegal. Um, still, like, this is, like, very shocking, but still the bill didn't pass two years ago. It has san uh, have san sanctioned, but the senators decided for, I think, for eight votes uh, that the bill wasn't going to pass. And the reason why this didn't happen is that Argentina is still a super Catholic country where women can't really decide over, over their own bodies, and the debate is always a moral one. Uh, people tend to debate uh, very childishly and very, I think, dangerously, uh, whether it's moral or not to get an abortion, and forgetting that abortion is a, is a reality, uh, and, in, and in, especially in a country where 30% of the population lives 
beyond the poverty line. That means that very, like not privileged women are exposed to very, very extremely unsafe uh, abortion options. So, facing this, I was like, first of all, this, um, this was born of a, a lot of anger <laughs> from me, seeing all the debates and see how politicians were talking about us and our bodies, um, comparing us to animals, I'm not joking. Um, so I just want to open a different conversation and not really a moral debate. This is not a moral debate. This, this needs to start being a reality check on what the reality of abortion looks like for women that don't really have the resources to get, to, to get a safe one. So while senators and politicians are, were talking about um, you know, whether it's morally, morally right or wrong from their own gender and, and class privilege, I wanted to show the real side of abortion. So I made this video while they were still voting uh, for, for the law. And I just want to show the real side of abortion, that is women Googling, basically, how to get an abortion with with a coat hanger, with um, parsley, with ibuprofen, with a lot of very dangerous things to put inside of your body, basically. So, and what I did is I, from A to C, I'm showing all these, social, all these options coming up on Google. And just to show the reality on how abortion really looks like for women that don't have the resources to get a safe one. And it's, it really gives you the chills because it's, it's super, Appalling. I'm going to play it now. I don't know why I still get so emotional. <laughs> so yeah, I just want to make like, uh, my point super clear. Whoever is uh, against, sorry, <laughs> against abortion rights is pro clandestine I mean, if you're against this, you're basically pro clandestine abortion, um, pro women getting an abortion with a coat hanger. That's basically what you're supporting. Uh, and so you're not pro life, pro vida. You're pro coat hanger, <laughs> which is completely different, and you have to live with that. Uh, so this video was literally a slap in the face in Argentinian society. It got more like 10 million views. It's very difficult to quantify how many views it actually had. Roughly counting, I came up with this number, but I think it's, it was actually a lot more. Um, so it got shared by a WhatsApp, and a lot of people actually posted it uh, as it was, you know, it, it was theirs, which I didn't care, obviously. Uh, it really didn't matter. Um, I just want the message to be um, out there and, and not really my name. I just want it for people to understand that this is a serious thing and just to reshift the conversation to whether it is right or wrong. I can say, hey, this is, this is what it looks like. But one journalist actually found me. <laughs> um, we, yeah, we made this note for TN, which is Todo Noticias, one of the biggest uh, news networks. Um, after this, I got a lot of super nasty messages, trolls, uh, death threats. <laughs> uh, I had to block a lot of people, but I'm kind of used to it, so it's fine. Um, I, who cares, really? 
so yeah, that was my, the first uh, cause I volunteered my time to, and now I'm thinking what is, uh, what is the next step, uh, what is um, the uh, next conversation that needs to be shifted around this topic. Obviously, I haven't seen a single cent from, from this, and not a lot of credit, just a, a couple of notes around, um, but again, it just, it just doesn't matter. Uh, I think it, it, it was good to use my, my knowledge, being a communicator for so long, just, and to apply it to a cause that it's, uh, it's just so important for women. Uh, second cause I worked on, uh, big caveat, I'm still finishing up this project. Literally, I got one of the videos I'm going to show you last night. The sound is not quite right, the titles are not there, but you're going to see what the intention is. Uh, so very, very fresh from the other day. The second cause I worked and volunteered my time for was sex work in the in Netherlands, a country I've been living for the last five years of my life. Sex work is the oldest profession in the world, uh, but it's still we're almost in 2020, and we still don't know how to deal with it. And the conversation is, it tends to be on like very prefixed uh, ideas on how the, uh, the the work really is and discrimination. So yeah, when I moved to the Netherlands, I had a totally different view on sex work. I was like, it was completely wrong, and going to the red light district was kind of shocking for me. But then when I started chatting with sex workers, um, I tried with a lot of them for over, over a year to be prepared to do this project, I just had a whole new perspective on it. And something that I learned is like, we immediately classify jobs in, like, in two ways. Whether it's a moral job, we categorize jobs like this. This is right, this is completely wrong. <laughs> uh, and just to make it super clear, sex work is legal in the Netherlands for the last um, 20 years. But there's still some sort of a double moral standard in Dutch society, because sex workers are still treated as second-class citizens. So they pay taxes. Just to be brutally um, explanatory, half of what they do every single night goes as taxes to the government, but still, they face a lot of discrimination on a daily basis. And that happens because society still shames those who step outside of a norm and don't have a normal job. And chatting with them, I also realized that there's some sort of punishment who, like, whoever uses the body for profit, you know, and for women it's even worse. Uh, somehow they get punished for charging for something they should be doing for free, like sex. It's, it's almost like they're punishing them just for having sex and charging for it. So, in the, as, as, as I mentioned, in the Netherlands, uh, sex work is legal, but no socially accepted. They, send, they seem to have the same rights, but not really. They pay taxes, but they cannot buy a house, because if they go to a, a bank to apply for a mortgage, they think their job is unstable. Sex workers, when divorcing their, parent, their, their, their partners, might lose custody of their children because of their lifestyle. Uh, they can't get an insurance either, and, or they can get a credit card. So it's quite cheap. <laughs> so it's legal, but life is again, very like in the shadows. So they face a lot of discrimination, there's a moral judgment on what they do. So as I mentioned, I spent like a year chatting with them. I actually became uh, quite good friends with one of them. We, we chat about work and we tell each other how goes, um, the things that go wrong is actually quite funny because most of the time she's more sorry for me than <laughs> for her. So again, uh, with this campaign, I didn't want to make a moral debate. Uh, if it's good or bad to be a sex worker, that's up to them to decide, not to us, the other ones, to win it. That's irrelevant, in a way. Uh, I just want to go straight to the facts. If it's a legal job, they should have the same benefits that I do. I do also have a legal job there, and I have a lot more benefits than them. So, 
This is the film we did, and then I explain you how we did it. I'm a nurse and a part-time sex worker. My clientele consists of people with mental or physical disabilities. Sex is definitely an important element of this job, but it's above all about intimacy, something that people with disabilities seldom experience. I'm really proud of who I am and what I do every day. But the woman you're watching isn't me. She's an actress, pretending to be me. I can't reveal I'm a sex worker, otherwise banks would not give me a mortgage. So, what we did with this, it's still, I mean, uh, um, I'm still finishing the film. There's a lot that I need to tweak on that and still missing the titles. What we're doing is we're juxtaposing real voiceovers of sex workers, but then we cannot really, we cannot really show, uh, show them because otherwise they will face a lot of discrimination, also from their families too. Um, so this is a story of Karen, that she works part-time as a nurse and a sex worker. Also, like, I wasn't really expecting uh, stories like that one, you know, like when you think like sex work is just the window, so there are like many, many forms of, of sex work. Um, she realized that their patients, uh, people like with mental disabilities, were also lacking that, that part of, of, the, of their lives, and she decided to offer that as a service. Um, and it's, it was fascinating. She was explaining, like, for, for instance, for a person with autism, it's, uh, it's crucial that a person knows exactly how it's going to play out. Um, so they know that you come in at this time, at five minutes later you get undressed, Ten minutes later, everything happens, and then at some point you leave. That's what makes them feel under control. I was like blown out <laughs> by all these stories. Um, but then it became very difficult to bring them to life, uh, because obviously they don't want to be part of the films, uh, because they can't. They, they just face a lot of discrimination, and they don't want people uh, knowing that they are sex workers and also because of the reasons I just listed. So what we did was just to use the voiceover and then use an actress and make that the, the idea. It's launching soon. This is like a, a premiere. <laughs> uh, I still have to finish. There are many, many other stories. Um, but really curious to see repercussions on, on in, in the Dutch society because it's a, it's a topic that really confronts them. It's like, hey, you're just doing this for the money. You don't really care about these people. So, yeah, I don't you see what's, what's going to happen with that. Then I'll take you to the third cause I, I worked on. And this one we did for the agency. Um, we decided to do something a little bit different for International Women's Day. That usually is just a couple of balloons and some cupcakes in the office <laughs> this year. We were like, can we just do something bigger? Uh, can we just do something in culture instead of just like in the office? Uh, we had, a, I don't know, like a, like a gut feeling that we wanted to talk about female body uh, policing. Uh, we decided to go with the boobs. Uh, at a very young age, you understand that your boobs uh, will be well, it's scrutinized by others and also by yourself. Whether they are too big, too small, too old, too young, too veiny, too hairy, too pale, too dark, too whatever. Uh, our cultural polarizing of women's body starts uh, very early, by like fifth grade or something like that, and it only gets worse with time. So they get talked about, uh, police scrutinized, grabbed, and censored. As you know, on Instagram, for instance, everywhere. So we make like a quick poll in, in, in the agency. And we found like 70, 74 women felt embarrassed about their boobs at some point of their life. This is a quite a high um, stat. Uh, so we decided to do a little stunt to shine a light on the scrutiny this body has to go through. And if you think about it, it should be like just an elbow, right? But <laughs> somehow it gets a lot more scrutiny. So uh, the action we did is called Just Boobs. 
So not too big, not too small, not too brainy, not too hairy. They're just boobs, and they should be able to wander around without you know, feeling scrutiny or judgment. And they should be able to wander free in the Amsterdam canals. So we threw, <laughs> we threw five giant boobs of all shapes and colors, um, and also like one veiny one, one hairy one, uh, one that had a scar. We threw them at the canals as a social experiment and see how people reacted. Uh, some people reacted really bad, like, what the fuck are you doing? Uh, some people reacted actually really well. Some people actually had a favorite one. Oh, I really like the hairy one. The hairy one is super fun. Um, or oh, the veiny one. Some people hated the small one. Like, whatever. The aim was to highlight the, the scrutiny and unnecessary sexualization that this body part has still to go through in 2020. And we wanted to open uh, a dialogue about everyone having an opinion about this controversial body part that, again, is just a fucking body part. It's, it's, like, yeah, it's like having an opinion about an elbow. Nobody has an opinion about an elbow. So, and just to wrap it up, ideas not necessarily need logos, causes don't really need egos. We need more empathy and not try to chase a reward constantly. I think this is an industry where we are like molded to be chasing profit and chasing a reward all the fucking time. And not everything in life <laughs> can be done to chase profit. Uh, or maybe you should be chasing a different kind of profit. So I really encourage you to pick a cause you care about, volunteer for it. Uh, give your precious time and brain and experience uh, as a designer, as a communicator, as a creative, as a human being to causes like you, you care and you think that will really benefit from having a creative perspective. Because I think that to accelerate the change, we need to start putting uh, ourselves second, not first. Thank you very much. <laughs>